So first, I have to say I'm very excited about this panel because we have uh, heavyweights of the crypto industry. So I would appreciate first if you could uh, give a short introduction and then we can kind of kick it off. I'll frame the discussion. We can have, start with some provocative questions, yeah? So please go ahead, yeah? Uh, I'm Alvin from KuCoin. I responsible for the uh, uh, institutional client and the web, web client. And uh, before that, I'm working for the uh, banking industry. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex. Uh, I'm the general manager of Binance FCD, the regulated exchange based in Dubai, regulated by VARA. Um, I've been in crypto uh, since 2016. I've been in financial services for about 20 years now. Um, and, you know, it's... It's fun but tough being the market leader, um, but the true market leader is next to me. Yes, yeah, it's fun but tough being the market leader in the niche product. Uh, my name is Luc Strijers. I'm Chief Commercial Officer for Deribit, which is a um, global derivatives exchange with soon to be the new headquarters here in Dubai. Um, we intend to get a viral license soon after which we'll move over the full business um, towards Dubai. So we're operated from Panama at the moment, which is likely to end as of end of this year. Awesome. So first to uh, kick off the discussion and to frame it. So two big things. One happened a year ago. The second biggest exchange on the planet, FTX blew up because we had mismanagement of clients' funds. We had insider trading, if you want to call it like that. We have an internal prop desk, Alameda Research, trading against the client, trading with clients' funds on other exchanges, and it all ended up catastrophically, you know. The second very positive thing uh, to frame the discussion, everybody's talking about the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF, which could be a big driver for the industry in terms of enormous liquidity coming in. But to kind of really go heads on, and to maybe get an opinion from each one of you is how do we make sure we prevent an equivalent of FTX happening again? So I really wanna, wanna get your clear feedback. What do you think about segregating the client's funds and assets away from the exchange? That the exchange is becoming a matching engine, not more than that, or not only that, but definitely not holding the client's assets. And maybe also to get, you know, we have two heavyweights here, Binance, the world's largest crypto exchanges, but also Deribit, the world's largest crypto exchange on the options market side. To, and you have experience actually with Clearloop, which kind of keeps assets away from the exchanges. Want to hear from you, what did you learn from the FTX experience and what are you doing to prevent that from happening again? Okay. Um, actually, when we uh, looking back, the uh, FTX actually, the mistake uh, happened many times in the traditional buying. Yes. Actually, it's not about the Web3 or blockchain or even crypto. So, uh, so how to protect the uh, uh, customer asset? I think the POR, after that, the POR is quite popular. And uh, every exchange is trying to uh, announce the uh, uh, POR every month to prove it uh, has uh, sufficient funding to supply the customer uh, withdrawal. And uh, for KuCoin, we, we absolutely provide it every month. And also, uh, we try in many ways to protect the, our customer uh, assets. And uh, for the East Crow solution, uh, we have experience on that. But um, we also see the difficulty because uh, when we go to with that, uh, the settlement cost will be, on-chain settlement cost will be new cost for the participant. And, uh, Based on our survey, some customer actually, they don't accept such high cost. Some customer accept it. So for the exchanges, uh, it would be a, a kind of a, a difficult situation. How we can lead in customer to, to do that? It's a kind of the balance, the uh, risk and the uh, uh, income. So um, I think Clear Loop and uh, the other, for example, Fireblocks, they, they do a lot of things. And uh, as an exchange, we are quite open on that. But, uh, whether we will adapt it fully uh, will depends on the customer requirement. Okay. And uh, so we can see in the bearish market, uh, the people actually worry about the asset security. When the mar market going up, and uh, I think the typically institutional client, they will new 
new balance trade-off between the trading efficiency and the asset securities. So we also provide the, uh, uh, the institution loan to our customer to mitigate their exposure to exchanges because we lend money to them and then make trade in our exchanges, which does help for them. And uh, so far, we're going to enlarge the scale on that. Uh, this is a way to balance the tra uh, trading cost and the uh, customer securities, uh, customer asset securities, and the trading efficiency. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so to, to develop, I mean, I think the, the reaction to move to a more traditional finance model of segregated custody, I think, is a bit extreme. The crypto is peer to peer, and it's supposed to be disinter, uh, it's supposed to be removed. The, the need for third parties, removing the need for intermediaries, uh, and reducing costs. And, and many retail, uh, and even institutions, maybe to have to mess around with additional counterparties. You know, if it's a small fraction of the, their exposure to the market, they're comfortable. You know, the crypto allows the trading exchange to, to custody uh, at relatively low cost and it allows them to collateralize their accounts quite quickly. Um, so I think we're going to have two, two process where you, we use things like Clearloop or third party custodians um, because uh, as my colleague rightly said, you know, gas costs of settlement per transaction is ridiculous and it will choke out the, the efficiencies again that, that we're looking for. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to think carefully, build carefully, um, really sort of capitalize on what we have here, the, the ability to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, and going back to FTX, yeah, it's a, it's a governance issue. It's not a, it's not a Web3 issue. Um, I think, you know, it, it should have been very transparent that the assets weren't there. I just think uh, maybe there was some naivety or laziness on, on everyone's behalf um, because the, the writing was on the wall there for a long time. Um, but going to your other point with uh, the Bitcoin ETF, you know, that, that does lend itself to segregation of custody yeah. uh, because traditional finance, traditional models of governance, you, know, you need to have the same process for the right people in institutions to, to sign these things off. Um, if it looks too different, it's not going to be approved, but it needs to look uh, as it does in traditional finance. Yeah. yeah, so let's start with FTX. That's the simple one. Um, after, so Deribit is, is, is perhaps slightly different than my, my neighbors here. We are uh, pretty much institutional. So we are 85% institutions give or take uh, a few percent here or there. Um, but that means that we serve as hundreds of large names. And for, op for big options positions, you need a lot of capital. So uh, a firm can deploy, let's say, 100 million uh, on our platform. And after FTX, allocation of those amounts are simply more, uh, more difficult because no one's going to make the same mistake twice. Yep. So it's justifiable, perhaps, from naivety that, that, that something happened to the industry. Everyone was overwhelmed. But having the same event happening twice, that, that, that will end you. Then your fund is gone, your job is gone. So everyone is way more cautious uh, versus a year ago. And the exchanges have to deliver. So we are getting licensed by Vira. Uh, we're, we're providing... Uh, audited financials by year end, we just got ISO certified, SOC 2 is coming uh, just after New Year's, all of that stuff which, which is essentially governance issues, um, uh, appointing non-executive directors yeah. lo that looking uh, at what we're doing, that, that look over our shoulders how we make decisions, all of that stuff in combination with like I think 78 policies or something like that, which have to be audited, internal audits and reports, etc. All of that stuff is the consequence of FTX, and uh, that will filter out the weak ones in the end. So those large firms will not deploy size if you don't adhere to most of this stuff. So all of us will have to get there uh, one way or another. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing. 
um, proof reserves, etc., is another thing. Uh, Custody is another one. So instead of allocating 100 million to us, you can also uh, allocate it to, you mentioned it, Clearloop, but we're building, I think, seven or eight external custodians at the moment. So um, if you are US owned, but operated from, let's say, Singapore, and you want to deploy capital with Fidelity, we will lock yep. capital within your Fidelity account. If you want copper, we'll do it there. If you want it on Fireblocks, we'll do it there. And whether that's a gas issue really depends on the setup because some of them are just essentially Excel sheets. So moving assets is not an on-chain transfer. On, on Fireblocks, it's on-chain, so it, it, it differs per account. But those firms know that their assets are not used to buy apartments or you know, boats or uh, whatever, planes. Because they're there, you can see them. They're in an yes. on-chain dedicated wallet on your behalf. They're locked. We can't take them, they can't take them, but they're still there. So I think that's a big step forward, which generates a lot of trust. Um, and then your last comment, the ETF. So for us, FTX, the ETF, and all of that stuff boils down to volatility. So it generates activity. If you look throughout 23, volatility was dropping. And for a derivatives exchange, and especially in a volatility-driven uh, exchange like us, it, it impacts client activity volumes heavily. So when stuff like this happens again, when FTX crashes, the price goes down, but volatility explodes. Yes. So people trade options uh, to either benefit from the upside, protect from the downside. It's in March, when the banks were crashing in the US, volatility explodes and options volume explodes. So for us, we, we thrive by, by, by volatility moments, which could be good or bad news, and the ETF is one of them. So yes, institutional adoption in a way, but also just activity, excitement. Who knows, it could happen tomorrow. Who knows, it could happen in January, and you want to buy the specific option for that expiry to benefit from, from the upside or the downside. So that's, that's, that's our model. Yes. So uh, before we go into the topic of uh, the spot Bitcoin ETF, I actually want to touch upon because each one of you mentioned something very interesting in terms of what is that the exchange offers in terms of services to professional investors. So I originally come from the hedge fund world, from, you know, FX. If I would ever say to anyone, I'm, I open an account at an exchange, even though there are so many exchanges in the FX world, they would look at me like crazy because you actually, your counterpart is the prime broker actually. So as the markets professionalize, your counterpart is the prime broker who gives you the securities account, the credit lines, the exchange is the matching engine where you have the products and so on. So in that context, going zooming into the crypto world, what do you see as the role of the exchange going forward? Are we going to see you becoming prime brokers or an equivalent of a prime broker? Do you see other service providers like, for instance, Hidden Road, who is kind of offering that quasi prime brokerage service, but on the professional trading side, not talking about retail, what do you see as the role of, a, of KuCoin or Binance and of Deribit going forward? I think for Deribit maybe this is the clearest answer in my view. I think you are dominating the market, but what is the role of the exchange in the future when I'm talking about professional trading uh, counterparties? Okay, oh, uh, okay, I speak first. And uh, as for my uh, point of view actually, I think the, compared with the traditional fine, the crypto exchange actually play too much low already. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think the, for the long-term growth for the market, I think exchange should encourage the more, uh, more, sufficient, more, more diversified ecosystems, which means uh, actually prime broker play the role which help the customer and investor and also uh, exchange as well because uh, the prime broker can provide the uh, uh, financing, they can provide the better fee because uh, they can accumulate all the uh, customers' trading volume. Yes. Then they can apply the better transaction fee from the exchanges, which benefit the yes. customers well. So um, also, some prime broker, they provide the uh, sound strategy yep. and also some kind of infrastructure for yep. the customer as well. So I think it's quite good because uh, exchange cannot do everything. Uh, I think exchange still need to focus on the uh, enhance the uh, trading infrastructure to enhance the, uh, the risk management to, to, to avoid uh, any significant, I mean, the systematic risk from the market. No. So um, I believe uh, the, the, the market eventually will go to professional 
and uh, when we mention a professional, which means the uh, they will uh, the market will go to segmentation, and uh, pretty much like a py pyramid, right? So the on the top of the customer, they will serve the lower layer of the customer. So prime broker serve the hedge fund. Hedge fund may be produce the pro uh, structured product or income product to the investor and something something. So I think the, it will be better for the uh, each, uh, grow, uh, whole market. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it remains to be seen how the, the direction of, of ex exchanges more like Binance. Their bit is a little different. Uh, it's a sort of more purely institution, but. Part of the beauty of, of Binance's order book is there are all types of traders. There's yep. you know, soft and sharp flow, yep. and that's what keeps the keeps it competitive. No one wants to just sit there with the, all the same type of traders, right? even institutions, right? You, you want the directional traders, you want HFTs. You need to have that full ecosystem to, to have a, a healthy order book. Yep. Um, so for Binance, you know, maintaining that order book is, is paramount um, and, and maintaining connection to the users. Yeah. Uh, we, we're a user-centric company um, and the, the company's value are the 150 million odd yeah. uh, KYC people we have. Um, so yeah, catering to these guys, we are lucky enough to, to have that market share yeah. Um, and so we should capitalize on you know, reaching out to, to our client base, finding out what they want, and, yeah. and sort of acting accordingly. Um, you know, and going back to what we just said with the market demanding proof of reserves, you know, that, yeah. you know, that was a knee-jerk reaction from FTX, but you know, the, that was what the market called for, and all the exchanges went for it. Yeah, so I partially agree, but it's also because we're slightly different, I uh, think, than you. We, I think prime brokerage in the traditional space uh, is key to growth of the crypto space as well for two reasons. One is if you are today, you are a $10 billion hedge fund, which all of them are coming at some point. Today, tomorrow, next year, but at some point they're coming. And these firms employ, let's say, uh, 500 people. Uh, in risk teams, compliance teams, etc., and they have training pods. And one of those pods says, "I want to trade, uh, whatever, five markets." Yeah. Onboarding for such a firm nowadays with five markets, looking at the UBOs, who are the owners, looking at where where you're incorporated. Some platforms even even don't have it in a, a residence. The uh, the drama you can imagine, uh, it will take whatever, two years for, for five platforms to be onboarded for those firms. So in order to avoid that, they would go to a prime broker. They face Falcon X, Hidden Road, Matrix Board, whoever, and it's, it's one uh, properly organized structure. They, they get like a full pack because they know exactly what they have to deliver. And the onboarding is done in whatever, two months. And then the next day, five markets are ready for trading. Yeah. Sub accounts on Binance, on, on whatever, everywhere you want to trade, and you're done. Best fees, best rate limits, co locate, whatever, all arranged fairly uh, efficiently. So they will choose that if the, the alternative is not worse. So if the fees are, uh, are proper, if the, the speed is proper, if all, everything is proper, they will go for the prime broker. So that's, that's one. And secondly, in order for cross-exchange efficiency, you want to do a 100 million Binance Deribit spread, you would have to deposit, let's say, 20 million at Binance, 20 million at Deribit. So 40 million in collateral for an almost risk-free trade. It shouldn't be like that. If you do the same in the traditional space, the, the margin requirements are ultra thin because of efficiency and because of the offset prime brokers offer. And that's what we're lacking. And that's difficult to solve because there's yep. exchange risk and it's not like for like. So it's not, not as easy as in the traditional space. But it needs to happen f for this kind of stuff, which is the bread and butter of a lot of firms uh, to actually be deployed in crypto as well. Yeah. Awesome. So going now into the topic of the spot Bitcoin ETF, first just to mention from my 
position, my thinking, it's enormous liquidity that we could actually get into the crypto space with a product like that. But at the same time, whenever I was talking to people on the institutional side in TradFi, I was even always telling them, do we really need you? We're already at one trillion, we did it alone. We had, I always tell them, if you own liquidity, you go to Binance, you want to trade the versatile spe spectrum of tokens of KuCoin options, go to Deribit. I was shocked the other day when I saw that CME overtook, unfortunately, Binance as the largest open interest futures exchange. And I'm reflecting then now what's, the, what's actually in it for the crypto industry once and if, I hope, not if, but once we get the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF. How are we going to uh, provide value to the ecosystem? How are we going to actually make money offering those products? And where is actually the space for us for that? Because actually, if you have a spot Bitcoin ETF, if the options, sorry, futures trading happens on CME, obviously there's you know, less opportunities uh, for the crypto industry you know, on, on, a, on a direct uh, contact basis. So want to hear your thoughts. Where do you see the opportunity for you in the context of that massive liquidity coming in? I still think you know, the future is in the crypto space. That's my dream, not in the TradFi space. How do we make sure that, you know, the, that, that the value comes from the crypto space and not from a wrapper in the TradFi? I'll start. Go for yeah. it, yeah. There's a long tail in crypto, right? It's, uh, you know, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi. Um, yep. I mean, I'm an overweight Bitcoin myself, but I'm not a maxi. There's a long tail of uh, different crypto products. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of use cases. There's uh, a lot of, you know, which we would probably touch on, you know, the, the, the talk of the season is real world assets. Um, we've got oracles, we have NFTs, you know, there's a lot more to do in crypto. There's a lot more we can do with blockchain. Um, so, you know, if it, if it anchors the, 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 the short end of the curve, we just go down the long end. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it brings the technology to the masses. You know, yeah. again, we're, we're in the industry and we live and breathe crypto, uh, but it's still very early. It's the penetration is, is, is less than most of the apps on your phone. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 as I say, bring, bring liquidity in, which we can capitalize on uh, and build better products. Yes, I agree there. So in the end, it's about access. Some, some people are early adopters. They can use the blockchain. They can deposit. They're not afraid. They're not afraid of being hacked. They have a ledger at home or whatever. Others are terrified and, and, and they want their Robinhood account uh, to be uh, hosting Tesla options uh, as well as uh, their Bitcoin exposure. And that's what the ETF offers. So if you look at what drives the crypto market, I think the common uh, denominator has always been fiat to crypto conversion. And that's what this will bring. It will bring billions of new money in the, in the system that will, that will trigger platforms, but the entire ecosystem to thrive. So it's, it's, it will enable new stuff. It, it will, uh, and, and having more collateral in the system will allow other trading as well. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin related. It, it can also be trading, uh, using your Bitcoin exposure to trade uh, Solana options or whatever. There's, there's, there's so many things possible which is only feasible if, if the ecosystem grows. And that can be done by, by like a proper use case, by, by, by coffee and pay in, in Bitcoin, which is not really happening nowadays. But the ETF will help. It, it, will, it will enlarge the, the system. Yeah. OK. Um, I think uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to see the CME, uh, CME the uh, open interest rate higher than the uh, finance. And, uh, I, I was in charge. I was in charge of the uh, SM venture company uh, in Hong Kong, uh, which found by my uh, my JD.com, and uh, from the the user, I mean the investor uh, perspective, I can see. So, if I going to invest in an alternative asset, I need to going to have the main mandate of it. Yes. So, 
uh, even the crypto currently, even crypto uh, market, market volume are already very big, but compared with the old money, it's still small. So when the old money is trying to enter in this market, even though this is a mega trend, the crypto will going up, but they're still facing the problem of the accountant, how we evaluate it, how we make a risk management, and uh, how we persuade the LP is safe, right? So ETF provide the, even, it, even the ETF is, is costly compared with the yes. direct trading in the exchanges, but it provides the EV, a vehicle for the old money to place their money to let entry to the uh, crypto market. So that's the reason I think the ETF would be, uh, uh, it, it will play a role for quite a long time to help the old money uh, enter into the uh, crypto market. Awesome. Yeah, that's the thing. Awesome. So I think Binance, KuCoin, and Derbit, we will play our role to, 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 to provide service to the, 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 the investor who already converted fair to the uh, crypto, crypto stablecoin, but those who try to stay, stay, stay in the old world, but they still trying to benefit from the crypto uh, growth, they might choose the ETF. They can save their quite a lot internal cost on it. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Okay. And uh, let's say the last question, uh, I think the most favorite topic of all of us, that's regulation. But let's discuss it in a very specific context. Um, one of the biggest narratives or hypes, let's say like that at the moment, is real world assets. So how can the crypto ecosystem invest into sustainable uh, investment opportunities but in the real world? So we had before investment opportunities in the crypto space, either DeFi, which was all of it unsustainable or a scam. We had also then a lot of investment opportunity on the CFI side with BlockFi, Celsius, Verger, which was proven that most of them were scams. So, so now we have opportunity to invest into real world assets. So isn't it ironically, we're taking liquidity from the crypto world and we're gonna deploy it into the TradFi. But if we're talking about these narratives that at the moment it's m mainly driven by MakerDAO and a few other players who are trying to get, give you access to real world assets, but let's talk about trading real world assets, what nobody has really cracked so far. How do you see this opportunity? Um, and also to compete actually with TradFi, how do you see these challenges um, from a regulatory perspective? Because it's clearly a security tokens, those are securities actually. And what are you preparing as an exchange to do that? And maybe also this is a bit challenging question for Derry because I know you have a very narrow scope of tokens, you know, where you, uh, or assets where you enable options trading because of the volatility and cross margining systems. But how are you preparing for this big narrative and, you know, what can we do to suck the liquidity out of the crypto space and put it into the TradFi in the context of real world assets? I'll start. So the, the major hurdle is, is, is jurisdictions, right? So whether it's a security or not, uh, a jurisdiction will want providence on, on that real world asset. This is the problem. Uh, ju jurisdictions have arguments in traditional finance. Yeah. International businesses that cross borders constantly fight over jurisdiction. Uh, and jurisdiction for dispute is, you know, it's, it's the first jurisdiction to, to, to lobby a complaint or a charge, wins, but then there's a, there'll be a subsequent battle. And, you know, I think until we're further along in traditional finance and traditional uh, uh, courts, you know, it's going to be a mess. Um, to, to have to manage that uh, point of execution for trading, yep. it, we're a long, long way away. Um, it, you know, no one wants extra latency on trading. And, you know, if you're going to have to check a database to see if someone can be a tr true counterparty of this, it's not going to fly. So I think, I think we'll see more synthetic tokens that are, are equivalents of a real-world asset first, uh, where there will be a, a market maker or someone who 
gives price discovery on that asset, um, and then you will take a price risk to e exchange it somewhere else. Um, that will be the stepping stone. I mean, at the moment, people are, are trying to tokenize, tokenize gold quite quickly. Uh, people are looking at extremely liquid products, uh, mm -hmm. treasuries. Yep. You know, the U.S. Treasury market is the deepest in the world, and that's that's something you can tokenize because everyone understands what fair value is. It's not illiquid, and you can get it in and out, and you don't feel like you're going to get hung. As soon as you start trying to tokenize illiquid assets, it becomes a problem. Yep. Um, so th these are the problems we see. Um, and I think uh, perhaps you know, encoding it onto the tokens, yep. um, the new token standards will, will be the way to go on this. Um, and, and most likely having ring-fenced exchanges with specific regulations, right? So you, you, you know all the counterparties are regulated. So then you, you might not have to, you, there's a qualification to get onto the exchange and then it's free to trade. So, you know, I think th th these are the things we're looking at and, and planning for. Yep. I think from our perspective, it's not really about trading of the RWAs because the, the not, not sure about the size of the trading opportunity. So if you want to buy Tesla shares, the market is liquid, it's big, it's, uh, it's accessible. So you can tokenize it, who, who benefits? Not, not really that many people. Uh, you can't do it much cheaper. Um, so you, latency is an argument. So then you can tokenize a painting and then we all own like 100th of a painting. But who's gonna trade that a few people every now and then? It's not a really, really business case. Where, where I see the business case is, um, you touched upon it, like treasuries but not the tradability of treasuries because they're highly liquid. No one, none of us should care because it's already efficient, but it's about using those treasuries as collateral. It's a collateral game. And the size, the sizable firms, let's take again the $10 billion hedge fund, has a billion dollar in treasuries. And they deploy those treasuries as collateral for whatever strategies they deploy. And if we don't accept those treasuries, then they won't, they miss out on let's say 4 or 5% yield, which is difficult to compensate. Then there's yielding stable coins or whatever, that kind of stuff. But if you, if you, if you miss out on 4 or 5%, it becomes very difficult to compensate that. So if we can create tokenized treasuries, whatever, some kind of basket that essentially says, look, if you deposit this with, with the industry, with miners, with Deribit, we can we can allow you, let's say, 95, 98 percent, uh, a little bit of a haircut in, in, in normal dollars, in virtual dollars, and you can trade as if it was uh, a fiat deposit. That's when you enable size, I think. Yes, sir. And sorry, just to mention, I'm really happy you, you stated this because when I was working in my hedge fund days, we never had any cash, actually. So it was all sitting in treasuries pledged as collateral to prime brokers, but kind of reflecting on real world assets, I think you make a very, very important point that if you pledge something as a collateral, it has to be liquid, right? So we kind of looking at that liquidity spectrum of real world assets, we are at a very narrow, you know. Uh, all, all of this real world asset stuff is, is lacking a proper use yes. case, and this is a use case. Yes. The rest, if, if Franklin Templeton uh, creates a tokenized fund, it's nice as a headline, but who cares? In yes. the end, it won't be used. It's, it's to demonstrate, look, we are an innovative company. We're, 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 we have some people building a blockchain project, but it's not, it's not a use case. And if you can convert that fund into an actual use case together with the industry, so you need multiple markets, you need a few um, custodians. If we can create an ecosystem that actually accepts this for almost cash, near cash, then, then it has value. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think regarding the real world asset, the stable coin is the uh, most uh, successful case because uh, it's building the bridge between the uh, uh, real world and also the crypto world. And it happily, uh, the, the, the newcomer can uh, pack their crypto asset to the uh, US asset. So, which means uh, they can easily to evaluate whether they can. Gain the uh, lose money or gain money from crypto. 
previously, if, if you're using the BTC as the base currency, you are not able to, to evaluate it very quickly. And also, uh, if the step coin actually provides a very perfect vehicle for the uh, newcomer from the trade world to the uh, uh, crypto world. But I think the, um, in the new future, uh, maybe some uh, real world asset will be popular, which is alternative asset, for example, property, and uh, consumer loan. And uh, in the third fine, they use their rates to make the property as the standard product can issue to the market. And uh, for a consumer loan, they use the, use the ABS to do that. But all of this actually consume quite a lot of cost in the intermediate service provider. For example, if you're going to launch your rates, you need to pay huge money to the uh, property management and also banking because one help you to manage the property, the other one help you to accumulate the, the, the cash, right, from the, yeah. the rental. So if the, in the future, if, if the uh, real world asset can use the more blockchain, also smart contract to doing the, uh, 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 the, the cash accumulation and also distribution, then the as underlying asset can, can save a lot of intermediate cost, which can enhance the uh, real world asset uh, uh, in, in a return compared with the uh, rates or ABS. Then we'll be making the other, uh, RWA more, more attractive for the investor. Yeah. Then people can use the step, convert the USD to stablecoin and then purchase the uh, RWA from the crypto world which get higher return compared with the tra trade invest, uh, traditional world. So I think it will be a, will be a future. Okay, yeah. awesome, yeah. And uh, so just last one question from each one of you. So we're in beautiful Dubai in UAE. Tell us, what do you like it so much here? Why is every exchange on the planet seemingly coming here? Where is the added value? And uh, yeah, where do you see Dubai as a part of your business plans going forward? It seems like all the people are coming here, so I want to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned the people and money come here. Yeah, yeah that's the reason why, why we're here. <laughs> and also, Dubai provides the, uh, the, the better uh, tax terms. Okay. And uh, also, I think that people, it's, uh, uh, the, the government is quite, quite positive to the crypto. It's uh, quite friendly to us. So I think the, every single exchange is trying to expand the business here, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for us, it's the strategic location. So I used to be based in Panama, which is our clients are, let's say, from the UK to Australia. That's our focus. And then Panama is totally the wrong spot. So it's, it's Dubai is in the middle. So time zone-wise, travel-wise, it's super efficient. Um, and it's the framework. So Vira has built like a proper framework. And from a derivatives perspective, in, in, in lots of comparable regions, it simply doesn't exist. If you want to go to Singapore, MES doesn't have a, a derivatives framework. So a lot of countries where there's a spot framework, which might be suitable for KuCoin and Binance, but it's not suitable for us. So we only have a, a few uh, choices available, and this is simply the most strategic, uh, work-friendly uh, location available for us. Okay, and, and just to understand, you will be, be setting up in Dubai or in uh, Abu Dhabi? No, uh, D Dubai. So we're going to be based in one central. That's uh, the, the DWTC where uh, yeah. all of the others will be as well. Okay, thank you. The key points everyone's outlined, but, you know, it's also an easy place to live. It's safe. The connectivity. You know, it's uh, the, the, the navel of the world. It's like the, the new spice route. We can call it the crypto route, uh, where crypto moves from east to west. It has to pass through uh, the UAE. Awesome. So thank you, everyone. I think it was an awesome discussion. Rarely I have like three exchanges on the panel where we can talk about some very deep topics, actually. So thank you much, everyone. This was awesome, man. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Thank yeah, you. thank you.